Thanks everybody for joining us for uh, our next version of uh, Live Since You Asked. We're really happy to have with us today, uh, Nathan Richardson of the class of 1989 from uh, New York City. Nathan, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, excited to talk to everyone. Yeah, it's great. We've been uh, doing these for about three weeks now and have all sorts of alums from different areas. Um, we have a group of about 20 to 25 uh, young men on board, so we'll, it's going to it'll grow over time. They're not always on time and they don't always register. But um, Nathan, can you talk a little bit? You know, St. John's Prep has changed a lot. You were you were there in 1989. Can you talk a little bit about what what your prep experience was about and and how that experience is? Uh, has stayed with you, and then we'll get into some more contemporary stuff. But always, always like to start off with the the shared experience at St. John's. Sure. Um, for me, you know, the the biggest thing that I got from St. John's was the ability to to organize my day and make sure that I was able to get different tasks done. Uh, St. John's obviously has a very big workload of uh, homework and study, and it certainly has prepared me for everything from college on through to my work life that I go to every meeting and every uh, engagement prepared for what I'm about to do and I put the homework in. Um, one person said to me, you know, in my first job professionally that for every one hour of meetings you have, you probably need about six hours of preparation. Not sure I would agree with six hours, but St. John certainly instilled a discipline in me to, to be prepared and be prepared for all the classes and show up um as if i cared and it, it has translated and uh worked for me throughout my career that's awesome it's kind of instilling that that work ethic and knowing that uh if you, if you put the hard work in good things are going to happen um we, we talked about in your your bio and, and kind of shared with everyone that you are the the evp and you you work specifically with the the points guy and you uh I, I know a little bit about it from from my world of travel for St. John's, but can you talk a little bit about what is the points guy and what is it the, the work that you do today? Sure. So uh, Red Ventures is a Charlotte, North Carolina based company that owns a number of different digital assets. Some that you may know, some you may not. One that I work on is the points guy in our travel vertical. Um, we also own a couple of other assets in travel expert flyer or million mile secrets. Um, Red Ventures also owns a number of other businesses like Healthline, which is the largest health site. We own uh, MyMove, we own AllConnect, which is a utility asset, Zuplo, which is a real estate business in the UK, and about 15 other businesses that come together to form a really healthy product. Uh, and the travel businesses are uh, specifically focused on people who like to, to accumulate award and loyalty points with their airlines, hotels, and their credit cards. And we have a team of uh, 100 people that work to go through all those different offers that you might have from a credit card company or an airline or a hotel or a cruise company and figure out how you can maximize those. So if you're traveling you know, up to New York or wherever you're traveling for St. John's, you're probably using a credit card to, to, to pay for it and sure. you should look at which credit card you use and choose wisely so that you can maximize the points based on what you want to do with those points. Um, you choose your airline and have a loyalty to an airline so that you can accumulate points and send your 19 year old on spring break uh, for free. Um, <laughs> no, that would be sending my wife and I on spring break for free. Exa exactly. Um, but we, we collect stories, we write reviews, we help people manage and optimize their, their points balances. And, you know, before I join, I, I know I have a lot of points on my different credit cards and different airlines, but there are tons of opportunities out there to, to earn double or triple or, you know, 5x the points if you choose the right card. And now I, I'm, after eight months of the business, I've found that the team will shame me if I pull out the wrong credit card. They're like, why are you using American <laughs> Express? You should be using a you know, Chase Sapphire product for that. You get more points and miles. So, um, <clears throat> you know, the piece that I would go back to is that um, the business was founded by someone who I've known personally for a long time, a guy named Brian Kelly. And Brian actually started doing points and miles mapping and figuring out how to optimize and, and, and plan family trips when he was in high school. So um, if you are, at home with your parents during this time and have some time go ask your mom or dad 
you know, what cards they're using and what they do for, for loyalty points because you might be able to help them navigate how to how to get to that next trip to Disney World or to the World Series or whatever it happens to be that's on that's your North Star. I'll definitely be contacting you offline to see if I'm doing things the right way to maximize my points. It's uh, it's a little hard to travel with a family. <laughs> Um, you've had a you've had a really um, amazing journey since since St. John's. Um, you spent some time in the Peace Corps. You've been involved in a, a number of different um, you know tech startups and tech programs, and and been engaged and did some great work at Yahoo Finance. Um, can you talk a little bit about your your Peace Corps experience and and how that experience has has stayed with you um, as you've made this kind of journey through through different companies and, and different uh, professional ventures and uh, in your work. Sure. So the Peace Corps is the slogan is it's the toughest job you'll ever ever love, and you know there's a lot to it. There are three goals if, if for the Peace Corps. One is that you bring it's a cultural exchange where you bring information about your culture to the country you're assigned to. The second is that you bring something of the culture of your home country back to your country to the U.S. And the third is that you provide some technical assistance. And <clears throat> I was assigned to Senegal, which is in West Africa. And it's fair to say that it changed me more than I changed them. I had some really sure. interesting projects while I was there, but I was assigned to live and work with a family in a secondary city. And, you know, remarkably, you know, that was 1993. Um, this morning, the first WhatsApp message I had was from my Senegalese host mother. And oh. so we're still in touch on a daily basis, whether it's, you know, a, a meme in French or a, um, you know, making sure that I'm not going to the beaches while I'm camped out in Florida. Um, it's really been a fascinating cross-cultural experience. But for me, um, you know, I was <clears throat> dropped into a country that had no real, like, infrastructure, water, electricity, phones, definitely no mobile phones or internet back then, and was given $100 a month to live. So you have to be really creative and you have to be really innovative in, in how you live your life and intentional about what you're spending your money on um, and in order to survive. But it was it was really helped me strip back to, to the things that are important and, um, you know, understanding who I was and very much aligned with the values of St. John's Prep of, you know, uh, a servant leader and being um, in business of helping others, uh, you know, achieve more in life. And that experience was transformational for me in understanding who I was as a humanitarian and as a human being. And I am grateful for my Senegalese family and all the support I had doing that and um, continue to be very much in touch with that experience. It's awesome that it, it stays with you. I, I was in Ecuador for a year after college as a lay volunteer with a, a Catholic volunteer program. And it's amazing how that experience kind of hits at different times and, and kind of, you know, especially now when kind of we're, we're kind of in this reality of life has to be very simple in many different ways and, and wondering how um, our sisters and brothers in the developed uh, in the underdeveloped world are, are dealing with, with the challenges of COVID-19 and what's happening in those worlds. Yeah, it's amazing that they, they're, my Senegalese mother is actually sending me messages telling me to be careful, which sure. is sort of bizarre given, you know, the situation in, you know, Africa and West right. Africa in particular, which has always been hard hit by various viruses and plagues and whatever else comes their way. Right. So if you take that experience from the Peace Corps and you, and you jump into your work at um, at Yahoo Finance, what, what was it like to be be a part of Yahoo Finance? And, and I mean, that's a pretty big name and a lot of our students would be familiar with that company, but what, what was that experience like? Um, that again, it was, you know, you have to be innovative and on your game all the time and you have to go in prepared to every meeting. So um, I got there and I was, I guess, employee number 700 something at Yahoo. And by the time I left, there were 16,000 employees. And, you know, I always say that if we wanted to be invited to the table, that we would need to be growing 30%, um, you know, a year. 
and not just revenue, but in terms of our audience. So we had a really, really um, talented team that I worked with and they we were all very much in sync and everyone was hyper analytical incredibly driven <clears throat> and always sort of like asking everyone on the team for their inputs to make sure that we grew so um, we were in a in the early days we were very much in a fourth or fifth position in the space against some incumbents and that was the early days of the internet and we did a lot of things to, to accelerate our growth and unlock value that we didn't expect to be there. So for instance, um, if you go to Yahoo Finance or any finance site today, you'll see that they have stock quotes. <clears throat> Historically, those had been on the back page of a newspaper like the Wall Street Journal. We were, were doing that online, but we were paying about $6 million a year to a company to provide those data points or datums to us. Our engineers, you know, just a junior engineer who really didn't speak up much said, well, I could do that for us with two engineers if you want me to do it for you. And so we went out about building our own ticker plant and did it with three engineers and ripped the six million dollars out of our cost base. But in the process, we unlocked this value that we didn't see coming, which is that we were able to take our own quote plant ticker plant and distribute it to others and all of the other people that used our ticker plant all their 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 users came to our site ultimately and our traffic basically went from you know x to x times 10 and our time spent where the old competitors were averaging like nine minutes a month spent on our on our site we were up at around 45 minutes a month spent so you know, working with a really innovative team that is in sync and that knows how to challenge each other and push boundaries and not question, you know, really be open to any ideas was really formative and to how I've approached every other <clears throat> venture I've been with, including where I am today at the Point Sky, where, you know, we're seeing a huge decimation of the travel industry with you know, Delta saying today that they're, at, you know, going to be at 96% down year year on year in terms of seats filled. Right. And that impacts our business. And we're looking across our team to figure out ways to help people continue to maximize their points and awards and loyalty systems to, to grow and to feel good about themselves and in the value of those currencies. Sure. One of the themes, you know, that, that we've had uh, this week and, and early last week with a lot of our webinars is, is looking at uh, innovation. And, and you mentioned kind of the the engineer who didn't say much, but came up with this idea that all of a sudden not only saved $6 million, but led to a whole new business model. As there's a bunch of students listening, what advice can you give our students um, about kind of that world of innovation, that world of entrepreneurship, and that world of kind of having the courage to share a new idea that's, that's kind of outside of the box. I mean, that takes a lot of, I'm, I'm sure it took that that engineer a, a few hours, if, if not maybe more of courage to kind of finally put that idea out there. What insights can you share for, for our students to encourage them? Um, you know, the, the easiest one is that anytime you're doing something with innovation is understand that it's as much a discipline as it is creative. So you should look for, just quickly Google like, innovation guidelines in brainstorming rules, uh, ground rules, because that's something that we did and we instilled in the culture at Yahoo, and I still find companies that don't do that and groups that don't do that, but like, you know, there are no bazookas in brainstorming. Like, there's no bad idea. And everyone, and you need to have icebreakers to get people talking. So even in this time, you know, I have, teams where we have engineers who are not accustomed to being in a group and we're doing icebreakers where everyone has to talk and you know we'll do something silly like you know what's an alternative use of your company badge that you've used during the the coronavirus or you know what's the first thing you're going to do when you get out of of quarantine so we're doing we're helping people to stimulate but also giving them a framework and structure and i think St. John's is really good at that and giving people the tools and helping them to understand how to apply those tools on a, in a systemic way. Sure. 
one of the uh, questions that came in that, that were to pose to you is one of the things we're, we're talking a lot with our students about is uh, this concept of a growth mindset of, you know, you know, it, it, there's not so much failures, but there's opportunities to learn. Um, as you look at your journey and, and kind of your experiences in the, in the FinTech world, your experiences in the Peace Corps, can you talk a little bit maybe about things that, that didn't go originally uh, as planned and, and how you've learned from them and how you've been kind of agile in the, in the face of those challenges? Yeah, no, it's it's <laughs> my my career is littered with all sorts of, of stories like that. And um, it is it is partly like knowing when to hold them, when to fold them. But, um, you know, Yahoo Finance is a good example. We built something that was <clears throat> probably as good, if not better than something like Mint.com or a personal financial management tool. And it was way ahead of its time. But it had, you know, at the time it had a quarter million users and was costing us more than it was making and we had to make the decision to turn it off and similarly we did that with a, a remittance product for payments which was way ahead of its time and we had to cut, cut it off and those things came both of those product features came back in huge ways and became billion dollar businesses outside of our organization but um, at the time you know, we didn't have the resources, to, the path to getting those to be billion dollar businesses. And, you know, the team takes it hard and you have to, but you have to continually reprioritize resources. Um, and I've had a couple of startups that have gone south and that's, that's really challenging. And, you know, you, you take lessons away from that and you get knocked down and you got to sort of get yourself back up again. And, it has a huge psychosocial element. It impacts how you feel. It impacts how you approach new things. And, you know, hopefully you do take some lessons from it and apply it to whatever you do next. What, when you're, when you're, when you're getting back up after getting knocked down, what, what do you use as a way to kind of inspire you as a way to kind of keep you, keep you focused? I mean, it, it's, especially in a time like right now, it's, it's kind of challenging. It's, it's easy to look at everything that's going wrong but how do you kind of focus on what's good and, and move forward? Um, so I, I was um, lucky to be involved in a couple of different sports at St. John's. And I think that um, the athletics is a huge way of me help, helping me clear my head um, and, and to process things and to think about things. Um, when I got to Peace Corps, I, I didn't have a swimming pool, so I picked up running. Um, and so, you know, since 1993, I've pretty much gone running every morning since, which wow. you could say is now an addiction. Uh, <laughs> and it's it's a good addiction. I mean, it may wear and tear on my body, but the science behind all of that is actually pretty compelling. So um, you not to get too much into an area that I'm not a PhD in, but like the uh, you probably everyone knows that, you know, fight or flight is the reptilian cortex and that's the frontal part of your brain and if you exercise or you do anything that releases endorphins in your body you're able to wash through the reptilian cortex and get to the cerebral cortex where you can make some rational decisions and behave normally so um, I am a huge fan of uh, using exercise to, to, to get your endorphins going and whether it's running for you know five miles or six miles like i do or you know there's a, a a coach out there named jenny evans who has something called hit the deck where she talks about doing short bursts of like you know 30 seconds of jumping jacks or shadow boxing to to recenter your mind and power through those negative thoughts or those fight or flight instincts <laughs> Dr. Carey would be very proud. I don't know if you had her in class, but that's, uh, yeah, all right, there you go. She's, uh, she's not teaching full time, but she does a great neuroscience class for our, uh, our middle school students and just did a program for faculty and staff as well. Um, you, uh, one of our students is asking, you know, kind of shift gears a little bit. Um, you talked a little bit about Delta's experience and their earnings report today, and, and you look at what's happening in the, the travel and the hotel industry. Uh, from your perspective, can you talk about you know, kind of the impact of this crisis on travel and, and hotels and where do you see things going in six months, 12 months, uh, 18 months as we as we look forward? I wish I had a crystal ball, um, <laughs> but, you know, uh, the way I frame it and I'm involved in a couple of boards in uh, 
both in the tech community in New York and otherwise, but we're looking at the crisis currently as being four different crises that we have to address that are impacting businesses and people's lives. And, you know, first and foremost is it's the health crisis. And, you know, until we know that there's, uh, there's readily available tests and we're, we're going to be in a bit of a, you know, a suspended state. Um, and two, when we can get to the antibodies, then the health crisis, maybe we can reactivate a portion of the economy. But to date, the antibodies are not proven as reliable as we would hope. So the health crisis is one, and you know, making sure that people are safe and healthy is, is paramount. Second one is economic collapse, and I think we're you know at 22% unemployment, which is something that has really deep and wide implications for every industry and the travel industry in particular is really hard hit with that. Um, and that can take, will probably take 12 to 24 months for a normalization to happen. The third thing that's happening is we're, we're, we're in a bit of an energy uh, crisis, which is, was not caused necessarily by COVID, but, may be state actors trying to take advantage of a weakened position. And, you know, with the news of oil un below, below zero, which is a hard thing to grok, uh, sure. you know, that, that could be good for the, in the airline industry, but immediately it, it's a bit confusing for a whole number of sectors that power our economy. And the fourth crisis that we can't underestimate is leadership global leadership and how we manage through this crisis um you know both at the in the political arena in the business arena in the education arena like what are leaders doing to educate communicate and um and manage through so i you know to answer on the travel space specifically we're seeing very different responses and leadership styles for from the travel industry so a company like Delta has been very positive and proactive. Their CEO is leading from the front and mobilizing their team to, to send the right message, to shift resources and make sure that their employees are safe. So, you know, they're the first and only ones that have actually gone out to initiate a clean campaign. And, you know, a month earlier, they said that their next five years would be about sustainability. And, pretty much on a dime, they have said, no, we're going to focus on clean. Similarly, um, you know, the, the hotel space has been basically, you know, havoc. I mean, most major hotel companies, um, Hilton, Hyatt, Marriott, have had to furlough thousands of employees. And we've seen very different leadership from those companies. And without judgment, I mean, it's having lived in a a war zone and lived through my time in the Peace Corps, you have to have a certain resilience and ability to sort of like push through the ground noise to focus on the target of recovery and hope and, you know, inspiring your team in a crisis like this and um, not get distracted by the thousand things that are going wrong today. But how do I get the entire team focused on, we're going to get through this. We're going to, you know, have, solutions to help us and how can I I lead and you know that's something that you're doing as the the head of St. John's that team captains should be doing that teachers people need leadership and they need to sort of not get totally distracted by all of the ground noise and focus on the longer term sort of goal and mission and north stars that you have laid out already. It's uh, very insightful. I haven't heard the, the breakdown of the four areas, but it, it's really helpful because um, we're, we're we're trying to figure out, you know, it's a, it's a microcosm of the travel industry, but we're trying to figure out the same challenges that, that we have to navigate at St. John's as well. Um, a couple of our students kind of combining a couple of questions of kind of when you were a high school student, um, you know, did, did you see yourself as kind of uh, somebody who was going to be an innovator or, or what were your plans for, for your future when you were a student at, at St. John's? You know, I wish I had the memory of an elephant um, <laughs> to tell you what I thought I was going to do. I, I mean, I think I was probably quite much more 
near term and tactical about like doing what I was going to do the next day or the next month. And in some ways, I wish I had that vision to sort of know what I wanted to be or where I wanted to go. I I have a I I do recall wanting knowing that I wanted to serve others and to you know help in a nonprofit or um, make sure that I was contributing to to a cause. And I know um, Mr. Mackinson is still a, a mm -hmm. teacher at St. John's and. He had done an overseas volunteer uh, initiative early in his career, and I remember that being something that I anchored to, um, you know. And I did accomplish that with the Peace Corps and went back to the International Rescue Committee. Um, those things are amazing. Um, they they didn't necessarily sort of afford me the lifestyle that I was looking for, so I I go back and forth between them. Sure. Uh, and the follow-up to that is when you think about your trajectory as a as an entrepreneur and as, as an innovator, um, what are some of your favorite moments? And and is being an entrepreneur something our, our students should strive for? Uh, I think first off, entrepreneur can be cast as so many different things. I think being entrepreneurial is a really good thing, <clears throat> and I think you can be entrepreneurial in a big corporation. You can be entrepreneurial as a teacher. You can be entrepreneurial as a doctor. I think that is one of the most important aspects of the U.S. education and U.S. economy as a whole is that we are we are not pedantic. We are very entrepreneurial as a people, and it helps us to power through crises like we're going through and will allow us to continue to innovate. So an entrepreneurial spirit is something that I think is really valuable. Being an entrepreneur is something you're gonna have to like determine whether you have the resilience and the grit to do because it generally requires a certain amount of grit and resilience that is uh, not for everyone. I mean, it's it can be quite a, a grind and it's not that it's 16 hours a day sometimes, it may just be a mental grind. And that's something that you need to figure out whether you have the right mindset for that. And, and it's okay if you don't because sure. the economy is powered by so many other things and not everyone can be an entrepreneur. I do think that St. John's has prepared people well to be for grit and for resilience. And, you know, I think of one guy I met at St. John's a couple of years ago, Bolin Lee, who mm -hmm. went by Brandon a few years ago. Um, you know, and if you guys don't know his story or has he been on the web webinar yet? He was on uh, last week or earlier this week. It's all running together. Yep, he was with us. Okay. Um, he's a guy that when he was still at St. John's, he made a trip to New York to meet me. We went for dim. His story is so freaking remarkable. And he's a guy that has grit, resilience, and entrepreneurial spirit. So, um, in what he's doing now, graduating like a semester early, running a business that's profitable, it's, it's really like, a testament to sort of the type of characters that St. John's graduates. Um, but no, I think it's not everyone should be an entrepreneur, but you should be have an entrepreneurial mindset. That's who we are as a people. It's a it's a great distinction and a great great uh, great testament to Brandon as well or Bulan. He he was great when uh, he was on this the session. Uh, I think it was last week or the end uh, the end of last week or the beginning of this week. They're all kind of melding together. Just uh, one one last question to close out, Nathan, and um, you, you referenced it earlier, but when, when you look at kind of the crisis of leadership, um, and you mentioned it a little bit, you know, we're really manifest in talking to our students about uh, servant leadership and, and working hard to make that as a, a hallmark of the prep experience. And in this context of, of leadership and, and in this crisis, um, how do you think we can be servant leaders and model servant leadership for, for others? Um, I think actions are like everything right i mean what are you doing to check in on people right now what are you doing every day to make sure that you know family members are, are doing okay are you calling them facetiming them making sure they have everything they need uh you know captains of teams are you checking in on folks not just you know engaging them in in online games but like what how, how are they doing being isolated in their parents house or do you need to check in on them? So I think there's a lot that you can do in terms of, you know, using technology to check in on people and make sure they're okay. Um, you know, I think it's 
it, I wouldn't say go out and do anything wild or crazy. Um, at this point, I think we have to be fairly cautious, but um, you know, the human connection is probably the most important thing right now. That's great. Well, Nathan, I really appreciate your time and your willingness to be a part of this and, and all the great things that you've shared in your, in your journey and, and congratulations on all you've achieved. And I uh, know of our prayers and best wishes for, for you and your family and, and good luck navigating homeschooling with your six-year-old twins. I'm sure that might be the biggest challenge yet. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Thanks. Good luck, everyone. Great. Take care. Thanks, Nathan. Take care.